Okay, yeah, so we can get started. So today, um, I guess the lecture will be in two parts. The first part, I will just be talking about some like basics, foundational stuff in video generation or like kind of the past like history of like the last two, three plus years of what's been going on in the area. Uh, and then in the latter half, uh, Bill and Tim will come and talk about some of the stuff they're doing at OpenAI with Sora. Cool. So brief outline, some basics, some general things of how you can improve like future work of video generation and then, and then more applications around like using like a, a video generation model as like a simulator and also potentially using it for video editing, which are probably the two main applications of these models. Uh, that are most relevant today, and the reason why people are potentially like interested in this area at all. So, I guess to start off, like training on video itself as a modality is actually quite different uh, than a lot of other modalities. I guess the other ones primarily being like language, and the other one being images. And one of the most annoying things about working with videos is that it's super, it's like really large. There's like a lot of numbers. Um, to get it to put into perspective, so a lot of videos that we view online from YouTube or that we stream are encoded using standard codecs like H.264, 265, AV1, depending on uh, what site you're streaming it from uh, and how recent or old the video is. Um, but in terms of file sizes, so if you have like one minute encoding of like HD 1080p like 24 FPS video, which is kind of like what Sora is generating um, in the end, it's roughly like 20 megabytes. Plus or minus, depends on the actual content of your video, but it's like somewhere on that order. Um, and then during training, what we usually do, whether like if you want to train on images or you want to train on, on video, you would uncompress that video, you would store it as just like a raw, raw byte tensor of like your, your pixels, like 1920 by 1080, um, and then like the number of time steps, which in this case would be like FPS times seconds. So you have, so if you want to do one minute of video, well, I guess this would be 60 FPS. If you, if you have one minute video at 60 FPS, um, then you have 3,600 frames, and then you have three extra numbers for RGB. Um, the number eight gigs is actually for 24 FPS. I just forgot to edit the FPS from 60 to 24. Um, but in total, your, your tensor, if you store it, would be, would be roughly eight gigabytes. Um, and then usually what you do is you also standardize it, so you divide by 255, and then move it to minus one one, and that would be from you went eight to a flow 32, so you would then have, uh, so then it would basically be even more expensive to, to store this data because now each, now each number is represented by float, which is four bytes instead of, instead of one byte before. So that video itself is only like around 32 gigs, which is uh, really big. It's like if you had one A100, you can probably fit, you, you can at least fit it on the GPU, M much less if you actually wanted to train it, it'd be, uh, Train on that data would be a lot trickier. Okay, so I guess to get some intuition of why like these things are compressed, because this is like a really big factor. Depending on the video, it could be like fifty to like a thousand x compression from like the original file size, um, or at least the original like representation in which we're training it in. So the way that some of these video codecs generally work, at least this is for like one specific kind. I'm not sure about exactly others, but they all kind of do similar things just sometimes in like smarter ways than others. Um, but the way these videos are encoded, they're generally encoded into three different kinds of frames. So it's like frame by frame. So you have iframes, which is also known as keyframes, which these, they encode, like they just basically treat that frame as an image and then they just encode that full frame, maybe using standard techniques, like something very similar to JPEG. Um, and then they have something called P and B frames, which are predicted in bidirectional frames which essentially, they don't encode the raw, the entire frame, they encode the frame conditioned on like some sort of like surrounding uh, keyframes or, or even prior P or B frames. Um, and these are, and they usually encode some sort of like relative. So it's like they encode like motion of certain blocks rather than the entire pixels. And the way these are generally done is the relative encoding is kind of like you can imagine uh, it, they use like motion estimation, so they store mo motion vectors of like uh, 16 by 16 blocks in, in, in your videos. So this is like a, a frame from like a certain video, and then the red arrows 
that you can see are basically what the, the motion vectors that are computed as. Um, which you can kind of infer, like, without even seeing the video, you can kind of guess, like, where the motion in the video is happening. Because there's nothing really happening in, like, the surrounding scenery that's kind of, like, static. So it's probably the, the, the big rabbit d doing something. It's probably moving his arm up a little bit because there's more motion around his arms and maybe tilting his body a little bit um, to that. But the important thing is that this representation is, like, very sparse. So it's, so this is kind of how the compression is kind of achieved in the sense that you're not storing like the entire uh, pixels or all the pixels or even in a compressed format, you're storing it relative or basically how much you're, you're storing this frame as like a delta to like a prior frame or even a prior delta of like a keyframe and, and how much stuff has changed. The one important thing is that they're able to also achieve really high compression is because these encodings are also fundamentally lossy. Um, for like MPEGs or like for certain codecs, you can basically choose oh how, how lossy do I want the encoding to be it's kind of like essentially like JPEG for for images or for, for videos, um, but even with like pretty high like with the video at like 20 megs or like 100 or 500 x compression, you can still get like really good like visual quality on your videos. So one way to think about how these standard codecs so these are like after like people like you know they use very basic methods in like machine learning of like 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 optimization and stuff like that that is like generally very fast like very separate very different from like the AI stuff we do today you know th this stuff you can run on your CPU you can stream it live as you watch a video um, so generally these, these algorithms are very fast but also they're surprisingly efficient um, and one way to think about these is the iframes um, so I guess for videos if you want to compress videos there's two things there's like spatial redundancy which if you just treated each frame as an image you can compress the image um, and there's also temporal redundancy, which is probably the more relevant one here. Like, imagine if you had a video at 60 FPS, then like one frame to the next frame would have very, very little change. Like, the arm can move up like two pixels or something, or the scene can shift like a few pixels. It's like, when you're at that high of a frame rate, like, there's a lot of redundancy that you can leverage to encode things uh, more efficiently. So essentially, a lot of works in the past few years on video generation is is like we, we, we kind of have all of like the, the tools that we need. So, so it, let's say we like video is a very complex distribution. We kind of know how to do that. We have like autoregressive models. We have diffusion models. We know those can model highly complex data. Uh, we have architectures, whether it's like units or transformers, like units borrowed from images. Um, transformers have been pretty successful in like pretty much all modalities. And so, so theoretically, we can just like use all these techniques train it on video and have a really good video model. So the question here is like, what exactly is the bottleneck? And the main thing is just kind of what I've been talking about is like this video data is, is very like, it's very compute heavy. If we just ported all of our existing methods in a naive way, it, it'd be really hard to generate like really long high fidelity video because there's just like so many frames you have to process and there's just so many like numbers that you need to process to to model the distribution. So a lot of the work has been focused around building and designing more efficient models. And this can take in a lot of different forms, which I'll kind of go over like the general paradigms. Um, and they're not exactly mutually exclusive. There are some overlaps where you can like mix and match certain things. Um, but I'll go over some like broad ways that people approach it. And also the relevant papers. So the, the first one is essentially, if in the end, let's say, for imagined video, they generated like 24 FPS, like uh, like 1080 by 768 or, or, or something like that uh, video. Um, and one way you can do it in a very naive way, you can just uh, take your unit, take like your full resolution, full frame rate video, train that. It's just uh, extremely expensive and they didn't have the compute really to actually do that directly. Or you would be limited to like a very small model and you wouldn't really be able to model anything complex. So what they did was, for a lot of these papers, imagine video, make a video, Pi, Pi Oko, and uh, Lumiere, kind of really puts it out from like two years ago up to like close to the present day, uh, is they break up the problem into smaller independent pieces. This is, there, there'll be some overlap with some of the stuff that I cover in the diffusion lecture, uh, with consisting of like, instead of directly generating full resolution video, you 
you generate maybe a smaller resolution video, and then you, you upsample it over space, upsample it over time, and maybe you can upsample it over space and time, but like a series of many different models that will do this. So we had this same figure a while back um, of how the imagined video is, where they have their text prompt, uh, they encode it using the T5 XXL for language embeddings, and then for generation, they do a step-by-step. -step. They have their really low resolution video, so 40 by 20 spatially with 16 frames. And this represents, I think, like like 10 seconds of video, if I remember correctly. Or oh, maybe not. This is also 128 frames at 24 FPS, so maybe like five seconds. Um, oh, it's at three FPS, yeah. Um, and then they go through temporal super resolution to expand in time, su spatial super resolution, sp spatial super resolution, temporal, temporal. This is a, a lot of different models. You, you don't have to do this many. Maybe you just do one step of spatial super resolution, one step of temporal. Um, but I think at the time, with like their compute budgets, they were fairly like, they had to partition their model into more steps of training. Um, and the one nice thing is now at this point, then you can you can train each model individually and independently. So if you only have a budget of like a thousand TPUs or something, then you can train uh, each like, then then each model would only need to fit that amount of compute versus if you try to do an entire pipeline, you'll, you'll need more compute to fit the entire model. Yeah. Um, these are some examples of videos. So this is what the state of it was like to, Two years ago, year and a half maybe. Um, and you guys will slowly see how like progress has been kind of made. Uh, the biggest jump is probably Sora, which I think Tim and Bill will have a lot of examples there. Um, imagine video of like a, of a teddy bear walking or running down the street. I think that's on the right is like a pan over Yosemite. I think. Um, and this was a more recent one called Lumiere. I think they had this. It was like in January. Um, this was all, all still, even for these models, all still fairly limited to short videos. So this was 80 frames, 16 FPS, so five second video. They generated, a, so this one has no temporal super resolution, so they directly generate all the frames, just at a low spatial resolution. So 80 by 128 by 128, and then they have a separate super resolution process that upsamples directly from 128 to, to 1024. Um, so, so this is like one other option to break down the problem in terms of how they approached it. But still a similar approach. So this is like less pieces than uh, imagined video, um, but still like a very similar architecture. Yes? For imagined video? Uh, yes. Um, that I'm not sure, but uh, so what, what it could have been done is um, they just directly, like if you use F of MPEG to process the 24 FPS video to 3 FPS or something. And the way F of MPEG does it, I'm actually not entirely sure. Um, it could do some combination of like cutting, the, of like slice, of like selecting certain frames and, and doing like uh, some sort of like interpolation. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about the exact algorithm. So it's going to have all the results and like put it from your FPS to the same path. Mm -hmm. Uh, and these are some examples from Lumiere. So definitely more consistent now in terms of uh, like the, the, the bear is a little bit more coherent, um, smoother textures, stuff like that. Okay, and an another way that, um, so, so that was kind of like the cascaded approach where uh, you, you break it up into small pieces and you slowly apply super resolution in, in various dimensions until you get your final result. Um, the, the other main method, which this is not really mutually exclusive with the super resolution. With all these models, you can always kind of do super resolution, but I, ideally there's just a need to like have as few models in your pipeline as possible so it's not that complicated and it's easier to scale. If you have like seven models in your pipeline and you want to train like a 10 times larger model, you have to figure out what part do I actually scale, how much do I scale it. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, if you have only like one or two models, it's like a lot easier to manage. And also in terms of like writing code for, for this kind of stuff. Um, 
so the, the other predominant approach that has been pretty popular is just a, a I guess what I call like a per frame language based models. This is mostly motivated by the fact that like like stability had their stable diffusion model. So so a lot of it was like, oh, we have a really really good text to image model. Now, if you want to train on video, how how can I use this text to image model? It doesn't exactly fit, but like it it, it could be useful some way because if you, if it boils down to like a, like a video generation problem, the first frame is like a kind of like a text to image generation problem essentially. So they're all very related, and uh, the way this approach is done is you can basically, let's say you can use your standard, your, your pre-trained VAE from Stable Diffusion, so that's, a, that's an image encoder, and you can take your video and then you can leverage spatial compression and you can compress each frame of your video. So now you have some sort of latent for every frame of your video. And then the kind of naive way if you want to temporally compress, because like if you directly try to train on like 24 FPS with this, you'd have to stack, like even for like four seconds of video, you'd have to stack like 96 frames uh, or concatenate latent, which is pretty expensive. Um, so what these papers usually do is, it's like kind of like a very simple way of doing temporal compression is you just lower the frame rate. So it's like, a, it's like it, it is very lossy, but it actually works decently well. So let's say, it's very similar in spirit to the 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 the, the, the like super resolution or the FPS like res super resolution, uh, where you basically just sample like you can concatenate per frame, but you sample your video at a low frame rate, four frames per second, is like pretty standard, and then after that you could learn a separate frame interpolation model to to upsample the frame rate. So in this case, there usually is not a uh, spatial super resolution model, and only something over time. Um, these are a few, a few papers that, uh, if you're ever interested, Alanya Latent, Emu Video, Stable Video Diffusion, they all use like a similar approach. Most of them in like the past year or so. Um, and the, the other one nice thing about these approaches is that what these papers all kind of do is now, as I mentioned, you have like this really good text to image model, Stable Diffusion, or maybe uh, at Meta they've trained, like like some, some other team has trained a really good text to image model, or at Google someone some team has trained a really good one, um, then they can use those weights to like really speed up their own training for video, at least because they, they, they don't have to learn just raw text image generation from scratch. Um, this I kind of talked about before. So you have your single frame, and then you can encode each frame of your video. And then in your unit here, so this is in the unit, you have like your 2D comms, spatial attention applied to each frame. And then the only missing thing missing here to model video is uh, you can add some like temporal layers. You can add a 1D convolution over time. You can add a 3D convolution over space and time. Um, and then you can insert attention layers. So attention over only the temporal axis. You can do uh, full attention over like all of space time, which is maybe more expensive, but it could be useful. And um, optionally, some papers do this, some papers don't is you can then freeze your uh, your spatial parameters to kind of retain retain like the uh, the image quality. Because I guess one thing for these generations is, is usually like uh, the, the the quality of images and the quality of individual frames are like kind of different. Like the, the distributions are a little bit different. Um, so if you want to preserve more of like the high quality like image generation capabilities uh, to have that carry on to generate like high quality frames, then sometimes people will just freeze the parameters, or also you occasionally see some sort of like some sort of like like degradation. The other the other option is if you also jointly train, which is very common if you train from scratch. You jointly train both on images and videos, uh, which is quite uh, important sometimes. Um, but yeah, but you can. So so the way Emu Video works is very similar to what I described. Um, the only difference is that they do some extra factorization where they first generate the image. So they generate the first frame, and then you have a separate model that generates uh, the rest of the frames, like seven or 15 frames condition on the first frame, and then they and at four FPS, and then they had temporal upsampling to 16 FPS. They have some masking to account for like what frames are conditioned. So it's like if the first frame is conditioned on, then, um, you apply information saying, oh, th this is actually not noise um, as part of your mask. 
And then also when you compute the losses, you actually don't compute a loss on the first frame. You only compute on the other frames. So these are what some of the videos look like. Still, still kind of like short videos. So this is like maybe four seconds. Um, but yeah, definitely, I guess it's an improvement over some prior works, like for Imagine Video, um, Align Your Lanes, stuff like that. Pretty good motion and pretty good like visual fidelity. Okay, so aside from, um, so I guess if, if you can, so if you want to use like the text image model and you can use your per frame latents, it like, it works, but it's a little bit, a little bit hacky and it's not ideal because the way that you're, le like the way that you're encoding like temporal compression just by lowering the FPS means that you need like another model to, to upsample the frame rate, um, which is not ideal. And then you also have to choose like, how low of a frame rate do I want to be? Um, so the other option here that has been more popular recently um, is basically spatial temporal latent spaces. So not only so now so stable diffusion has a VAE that compresses over time per image. Uh, so why not just train like a new VAE or a new autoencoder that just compresses over space and time simultaneously? So there are some pretty old works, um, something I worked on a while back with VideoGPT. Uh, TATS was another work that was a follow-up. Both of those were training like 3D CNN, VQVAEs, VQGANs, uh, and then the, and then you use like an autoaggressive model to learn the videos. Um, LVDM here is very similar, um, but for like a diffusion model. So they train a 3D CNN VAE and then they learn diffusion prior. Um, and then for yourself, for one example is if you had your, your, your video was like 256 by 256 images, 16 frames, then you can just, uh, kind of, it's, it's like basically the same, the same architecture as like a, like a CNN over images, but you just replace like the 2D comms with 3D comms, or you replace like some downsampling with downsampling over space and time. You just have to control over like how much you downsample over space and how much you downsample over time. So for example, here, it's like you downsample over space a lot more. So it's, you downsample by factor 16. Uh, for time, you downsample by factor 4. This mostly comes with, like, I guess a lot of experimentation with the different downsampling factors um, and highly depend on certain things like the frame rate. So, for example, if I, if I double the frame rate of the video, then I can probably downsample by another factor of 2 or something because there's just a lot more redundant frames. The, the one the one issue, I guess, is that, which kind of alludes to what I mentioned before, is that um, it's not exactly, like there are ways around it, but it's not exactly obvious how you would also want to jointly train on images. Because when we're training these, so now we're learning a new latent space for these videos. So it's kind of hard to take advantage of like a pre-trained text image model. So you have to train this, uh, this like video generation model from scratch. Uh, and then when you do this, you would also want to like, almost definitely train on both videos and images at the same time. Um, one of the reasons why you want to do this is because, uh, well, I guess one, there's a lot more image data available. And, and let's say if your model can process, like trains on like one 32 frame video, then that can either be one 32 frame video or it could be 32 images. Um, so kind of with the same amount of training time, you can see a lot like significantly more images than you would like individual videos. And that's kind of nice because the images are now independent instead of having like your frames being like highly correlated. So you, you, you get better images, or you, you get better gradients, you, you see like more images, you see like a lot of diversity in like text to image alignment. And then usually there's a lot more diverse text to image data than actual like text to video data in some cases. Because text to video data is like a little bit more harder to collect. So there, there might be some like style things that you want to be able to like transfer over. Like if you want, I want to generate the video, like a video of a dog running around in the style of like like a watercolor painting. There, there might not be that kind of like text video data, but you can pretty easily probably find like um, like a text to image example of like a watercolor painting or something. So you, you kind of want that transfer too. And uh, so, but with the 3D autoencoders, since it's downsampled temporally, then it's not obvious since the image is just like a single time step frame. So it's like, it doesn't really fit well with the architecture if it's downsampling over time because there is 
because if it's like if you're downsampling by a factor of four over time and your image is like it's like a video with one frame, how exactly would you even downsample that over time? It's not obvious. So the one kind of way that people have done it uh, that seems to kind of work is that you just design your architecture so you encode the first frame as just the first frame, and then you encode the rest of the video frames uh, with like your standard temporal downsampling. So you have weird video shapes now. So you have like let's say like a 16 by 256 by 256 by 17 by 256 by 256. Then you would encode your first frame into a into a latent that's one by 16 by 16, and then the rest of the 16 frames would be encoded in like a temporal downsampling manner, which is four by 16 by 16. And your entire latent would be something like five by 16 by 16. Um, this was used in like Fanaki in like the Magavit series. Video Poet, uh, Walt, pretty, pretty wide variety. I guess in this class we didn't really talk about Maskit prior. It's kind of like a discrete diffusion thing, not exactly. Um, for and then like autoaggressive models, people have explored using these methods, and also for Walt is is like a diffusion. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is training the like the video generation model or the autoencoder part. Yeah, so it um, it largely depends on your architecture. So let's say um, so so let's say. Uh, yeah, I mean one way you could do it is let's say if your downstream model is just a transformer, you could just like pack things together. So like. Let's say one of your batches, it could be um, uh, the, like the video tokens, and then the other batch could be just packed image tokens. And then um, you just need to be careful about what you attend to. So maybe you only attend within each image that's like packed, and then you compute your losses like per image. Uh, that's like a pretty common way of like you basically just uh, tr like you just you just pack your frames and you treat the like instead of you have like a full video or you have like a full video but each frame is like a separate image. And they and they just have to make sure that there's no like cross image computation. You just have to like mask, mask things out in the computation. With attention you just mask attention, which is probably the most common way. Yeah. Uh, is it necessary to add one? Um, because I imagine you can just treat the first one as the first image and then have the other three, let's say if you have four, right? Have the other three be um, because like I guess if this was like uh, well if the input was let's say 16 frames then you would have like your first frame and then you would have 15 frames left over um, which is you can't downsample but after four cleanly um, does that answer your question I'm not sure if I fully understood <laughs> So the the first one, I guess, doesn't doesn't go through any of like the temporal downsampling parts of the network, and the the rest of it does. Yeah, because they represent different things. The, the one is one frame. The four is like sixteen frames. Okay. This was from Fanaki. So this was like similar qual. I guess like uh, in the same time span, like concurrent work as Imagine Video, like a year and a half. Ish back. This is like a, what is it, an uh, astronaut riding on a horse um, in a sunset or like something like that. Um, this is from Walt more more recently, like three, three months ago, four months ago. This was a diffusion model, but able to generate a lot, a lot more consistent video after like a year and a half, two years, and uh, less, less artifacts. And this was another kind of recent one. There's, there's a lot of papers in the past like few months uh, from Video Poet. This is an, an autoaggressive model that I think I showed in like one of our first lectures of different samples. This one they interestingly chose like a like a phone like a like a vertical resolution, which is not that common. Kind of interesting. 
Um, the one thing that is interesting to talk about um, for, for Video Poet and for some of the papers in which they learn language spaces is that, so I guess you all train like VQVAs in, in homeworks. So you know how that works in, in terms of the VQ. Um, there's been more of a shift in terms of not using VQ and switching to a different kind of uh, discrete autoencoder uh, called LFQ or FSQ, both concurrent works. Um, but this is more specifically FSQ, but they work extremely similarly. And the intuition here is actually, it's actually much simpler than VQ. So VQ on the right here, you have a, a code book that you index into. So your, your encoder outputs a vector. It, it has like a nearest neighbor's lookup of the encoder and then uh, encodes that as a discrete index. Uh, for FSQ, these are much more similar to like the VAEs, I guess. You, you learn like a low dimensional uh, embedding space. And then the way you quantize is it, you, you basically just round. So, so you somehow, so this is like a, like a unit cube in like some sort of like d-dimensional space. Uh, and then the way it's quantized is you just define like these, these bins, like those points in like this d-dimensional hypercube. And then you just round to the nearest bin. So what, what this looks like in practice in, in terms of how you code it is like you, you squash your representation to like minus one, one. And then if it's like, Eight or nine bins that are like uniformly spaced from minus one one, and you just you just round t to that nearest bin, uh, and that's all it is. Um, the, the gradients are still propagated using straight through estimator, like for VQ, um, but in practice, this is like much more simpler. To, it's like simpler to implement. You, you you don't have that annoying like VQ loss for the embeddings, um, and I haven't really seen when I've used it. I haven't really seen any like code book collapse that you might see during VQ training. Uh, and it seems to work a lot better. The one, the one no other like actually nice factor, aside from like stability and that stuff, is that with, with VQ, um, so here is, is different metrics. So like the reconstruction quality on the top left, uh, sampling, sampling quality of like a downstream generative model they train on these discrete codes. Is that with VQ, what you observe is that as you, on the x axis, as you increase the, the, the code book size, so this is from like the max is like 2 to the 16, um, like 64K, uh, you actually start seeing like a degradation in performance. So it starts getting worse. It's like a, it's like a weird U shape um, for both reconstruction and for, um, for downstream sampling. Uh, versus if, for these FSQ, LFQ style methods, you can, at least it doesn't seem, it seems to be steadily decreasing. So you get better and better reconstruction with more codes, and then you get uh, better samples. Yeah, it uses the, the straight through estimator. So it's like you, the encoder, and then you round, and then you decode, and there's a straight through to that. Um, so yeah, so the method is so like most VQ methods trained with maybe code book sizes of 16K, 32K. Some of the more recent, like for Video Poet that uses this autoencoder, they trained, their code book size was like 260K. So significantly larger. Yeah. Um, pretty high usage, like for training, you can get up to like 70, 80% code book usage. So it's like, it actually has a very high coverage. Yeah. It might be, I think part of the reason why it's easier to predict is that the way it's constructed is like semi-factorized. So um, if you have like 260K total codes, you can break it up into like separate code books of like size eight. Like you have uh, eight, like code book size of eight, code book size of eight, code book size of eight. And that in total is like eight times eight times eight, like unique combinations, which is uh, what is it like five five twelve? Um, so that, those are like the five twelve codes you have, but it's broken down into like three discrete latents of like eight code books each. No, no, there's this other rounding, yeah. Uh, you, you 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 scale it to something from like zero to eight, and then you just round. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, so we would care about quantization, yeah, if it, or if we want to do some sort of like discrete generative model. So whether it's usually an autogressive model or like. For this, yeah, for the diffusion model, you can train this exact model, but just not have the quantization. But then it'd be very similar to like a VAE function. Yeah, I guess the only difference is that you have the 10 H swashing. Okay, so next section is really brief on how to improve video generation models. Because th there's been a lot of, like, there's been a lot of works. People have tried a lot of random things of like, of like doing different super resolution and time and space and um, the different like length data, different resolutions of data, stuff like that. And I think these are still probably the key main main axes, or, or even the type of generative model. It's so like the fusion model, auto aggressive model, mask it. Um, but in the end, I think these are the kind of the three key axes of which you can probably is like is like the most like long term improvement. Um, some of them are kind of straightforward. So the, the first two are are kind of in line with each other. So as we all kind of know, uh, scale is like just really useful in these larger models. As you like train on larger and larger models, if you want if you want to perform better, the easiest thing to do is just to train a larger model. Um, Something related to that is just for representation. How can you learn more compressed latent spaces? So you can think of the the like something that is kind of compressed is the latent space of like per frame encodings using like a, a image VAE. Uh, more compressed than that would be a like a a three D VQ VAE or a three D autoencoder of some sort that compresses over space and time. Um, but in terms of design space for how these representations are learned and and how these latent spaces are learned, I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, but very related to the first one, because the ideal is like the more compressed your latent space is, uh, then the larger the model you can train, because the the, the more efficient, like the, because like yeah, the more efficiently you can model the data, the larger you can actually scale up, given like a fixed compute budget. And the other I think is also equally, if not perhaps more important. Um, to some extent, is just uh, better data. There's like, from from everyone I've like talked to, in industry and or people at startups or whatever, it's like, there's like so much, like your your model can be better and better. There's almost no limit to how good your model can be if you just keep working on data, essentially. Yeah. So when you say better data, do you mean like is it like more video, longer videos, more labels? Yeah, I'll I'll go into that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, one way to think about it is that the data is the model, essentially. I think in, in the limit of like more and more compute, uh, the exact type of architecture or even <clears throat> generative model, if you can scale to that much, whether you use diffusion or autoaggressive, I think it's like you'll end up getting like a similar model if you train on exactly the same data or perhaps with the same training process. You know, no exact evidence to support that, but it seems to be the impression that people have been having that that uh, the, the data is what pretty much most of the your model, conditioned on like some fixed amount of compute. And and so I guess what exactly does this look like? What kind of videos, what kind of data do we actually want? So a lot of this work, if you're interested, I think uh, stable video diffusion has goes into pretty detail about what they did. Um, but there's different like axes of what constitutes maybe good data. You want good motion, so you want a lot of like dynamic stuff in your video. You want things moving. It's not very interesting if like you're modeling a video of like a person doing a PowerPoint slide, um, or like someone just standing still, a person just like talking for two hours in like a Zoom call, you know. Um, usually using like something like optical flow. Uh, other one is if you happen to have so this may or may not so if you happen to have text video pairs, so text data, um, because video data by itself is very easy to scrape. Like you can just crawl YouTube or you can crawl some other like video hosting site or something, uh, but you might not necessarily could get like guaranteed good text labels. But if you do happen to have it, then you can do some sort of like clip-based filtering. Um, and the other axis is kind of like quality. It's kind of hard to measure, um, but easiest one is maybe resolution. There are people that have like aesthetic scoring models that they trained. I guess where they curated like specific data sets where they deem something's aesthetic, and then they, they train a model to like output a score for that. Um, and then there's also other auxiliary metadata you can have, like likes and views, stuff like that. Um, because ideally, it's like 
if a video has been viewed a lot or people like it a lot, it's probably a good quality video to some extent. It, it depends on what your downstream use case would be. Yeah. Not, no, nothing, nothing public. So I, I only have for image generation. There's, there's been studies for that for image generation. Not sure about for videos. I haven't seen anything. Um, and yeah, so the, the other aspect that's been gaining a lot of traction recently, there's been like a few papers on, is as I mentioned, it's really easy to scrape video data from the web, uh, but you don't have text labels. And also maybe those labels aren't good. Even for like, if you have it from like, Lion 5B, like those labels are not that great. So the solution is just to synthetically annotate the data using like a VLM. These VLMs have been getting pretty good in terms of like captioning capabilities. Um, you can use easiest, you can use like for stable video diffusion, they use some off the shelf ones. They use, I think, Coca and they used uh, some other video captioner. Um, and they had like an LLM like summarize and combine those two captions into like a single video caption. Um, the other way that they did for like Dolly 3, that I think, should the next slide? Oh yeah, uh, I think Tim and Bill would briefly talk about this as well. Um, they just uh, generated, or they, they just they just curated a lot of high quality captions, maybe that people wrote, and then they train, a, they fine tune a VLM on top of that, and then um, they caption like their, their data set with these captions. So you can see um, all text is the original text, I forgot what SSC, I think SSC was like using like a very simple captioner and then with their dense one, uh, it's like a lot more detailed. This generally relies on like a pretty good base model that you fine tune or else potentially you might experience a lot of hallucination where like the captions contain information or contain like words that, words or objects that don't actually correlate with the original image or video, uh, which would then bleed into your downstream video generation model where it may start uh, like hallucinating certain things that you didn't want it to do. Yeah, uh, stable video diffusion here, they basically use purely synthetically labeled data set of like 150 million text video pairs. So it seems to work pretty well. And there have been some other like works that I've seen for text to image generation where it actually, if you use these synthetically labeled data, it it's actually ends up being just better than the original captions. Because for, from Lion, they're like pretty bad usually. So I guess to answer some question, the other part about this data is that good quality data can also be like very high. Like if you want to train a very good text to image, text to video model, another aspect would be very, very high, like text to video correspondence. Um, imagine if you had like a one minute video and then you had a caption of like a dog running around the grass versus a caption that goes into like excruciating detail of like maybe how the camera pans or how the dog moves, what objects, like what, what color they are what objects it interacts with, stuff like that, um, would actually be ideal, because then you can just feed it to the, the downstream like video generation model and it, it can learn all those correspondences. Um, and the last aspect here, kind of related data, is it's been shown to be very effective if you all just, you carry a really small set of like, you know, a thousand, 10,000 images or videos of like, like extremely high quality. It's like, this is like you, you filter like, like 10 million images down to like 10,000 or something uh, using some heuristics or, or, or some ways of, or some like metrics to measure that. Um, and then you can fine tune your model and it actually can make like a really big difference. Okay, so the last part that I'll be talking about is different applications. So the first one is video generation models as physical simulators which goes pretty far back in time. So this was originally a pretty popular idea, I guess, in robotics back in like 2016-ish, 2017. Um, in the context, yeah, so robotics, so that is like a pretty common on, on the, 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 the videos of like a robot arm moving and pushing objects. It actually was one of like the most common like video generation benchmarks that was used like in the past like few years. It's kind of like the CFR 10 for like video generation. Um, then there's like games, like Atari is down there. Um, 
this self-driving. So these are some of like, the original video data sets, mainly the self-driving one from KitKitty, and then the robotics one. It's probably like the, the bare robot pushing data set. Yeah, so I guess the intuition here was that if you can predict like the motion of how the car moves or how the, the robots interact with the objects, then you can learn a lot about the, the physics of interaction and potentially use that for different use cases like uh, for planning and stuff. This was from on paper in 2016. Uh, at this point, the video generation models are like, pretty bad. These are like, I, I wouldn't even call them like generative in a sense because they're kind of like, they're trained using MSE loss and they're like conditioned on robot actions. So it's like a fairly deterministic prediction. Like if you say I want to move the arm a little bit to the left, then it's like pretty deterministic in terms of what the outcome is. So there's not that much randomness. Um, but you just want to model and see if you can actually like if I if I push this arm into like a into into like a a ball, the ball will maybe fill that force and maybe it would roll like across the bin, something like that. Um, these are just some examples of, of how they of like fairly low resolution uh, results that. They use for, for downstream planning. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, so in the end, it will model only what is in your data. So if your data does not contain crashing cars, it will not model that. So, um, so in, in general, uh, if it had a lot of crashing cars, yes. Yeah. If it had like one instance, I, maybe not. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah, I'll, I'll go over some so like concrete examples, or or sorry, even how they're actually used in downstream situations. Or yeah, kind of. I guess I was going. I don't know if you want to talk about this, but I was going to ask if there's like any RD video tools or simulations of like things that aren't in um, that aren't that, that aren't part of actually by like like uh, physics based simulators, or are these videos used to train maybe the perception cap of a vehicle? They're usually used as like visual planners. So it generates like a visual plan of like, well, I, I guess uh, this is an example here. So like if, if you, you can prompt it with like the first, like the first image, let's say it's ground truth. And then this, this text to video model, you can say, oh, place, place the hand above the blue cube. And then it will do a generation of the, the, the robot doing that. And then you can use that resulting generation uh, to, to then, um, I don't. Okay, I don't have it right now. Um, I think it's another paper where you, you can use that gener like you can use that generation and also like what people call like an inverse dynamics model, where they they take two adjacent frames and they compute the the, the robot action that was taken, uh, and then you can do that for every adjacent frame and that will produce like a trajectory for the robot motion, that you can then do to try to replicate the plan that was generated. Is there a question here? Um, I guess in this case, I mean, what are the in these cases, it's usually pretty good, but it depends. Yeah. For, for, for example, for the robot thing, in this case, you said you said that. So there's one thing that I guess there's also one thing that you guys can do for the video. There's some. So, so there, there's also a thing like, is there like some thing and thing like this RTL thing for uh, the GAN? You know, like the image generated by GAN, and then you just put it into the, the source of the thing that like people have done. Um, not super common. Yeah, people stop doing that for some reason. Um, but for these cases, usually they're examining like uh, downstream videos that are like, I wouldn't say out of distribution, but the like like 
locations of blocks that are usually not in the training set or something like that. Or same thing for videos. You, usually for like large scale text to video models, I wouldn't worry about too much about like um, just like like memorizing a video and like and outputting that uh, unless like you really me messed up the like the, the pipeline of the, the video data. Well, if, if the video is present like like 20 times in the data set, it, it could memorize it. Yeah, it's possible. If there are a lot of like duplicates of certain things. But if for any, I, I'd say that for any problem that appears in text to image generation, it could also appear in text to video generation or even for language. This was another example of like how you can condition different actions. Uh, you can close the middle drawer. So this is all generated video, just conditioned on different successive text prompts. You can open the drawer, grab the water bottle, stuff like that. So it's like some sort of like physical interaction through the text. This was another example from some from Wave, where they trained a uh, they trained on like text. Uh, what is it? They, they trained on like self-driving data, video data. So this is all just generated video, which you can kind of tell if you really. Squint or oh, oops, but yeah. So I was able to like do things like oh, it knows it's supposed to stop when the car is in front of it. Um, you can do turning. You can like change. I think it was almost going to change lanes, but yeah. Do, do different times of day stuff like that. Yeah. Um. Kind of similar to the one I showed before, of like where you can ask it to open and close the drawer, you can prompt with different text. So this is also trained on like a lot of other data, like language data, of actions, um, and and videos. And then you can do a driving simulator and and turn in different directions. So I guess if you ask it to turn left when it's already close to the curve, it might like veer into the curve, but not not exactly crash. So it's still kind of biased towards the distribution. Kind of to answer a prior question, it's like if you ask it to turn left there. It's not going to go onto the curb. It's probably not going to, because all the data was probably generally like good driving, like like a good driver. They're not, they're not going to do crazy things like crashing into things, driving off, you know, running into people, stuff like that. So it's probably not going to do that either. Uh, oh, this is just the model. They just have different modalities. They have like the the video frames, the actions, which I think is like the steering wheel. And they have different, like I guess they have like text descriptions of certain things happening. They just train on all that, um, just on like a concatenated autoregressive model in this case. Nothing, nothing too crazy. This was recently from Covariant, which they released their uh, robot model. Which part of it they had a lot of capabilities, but part of it was video generation. The bottom left one here is a generated video. And then the bottom right was the actual the actual like resulting um, like the, the actual motion for ground truth, and then top left was like let's say like some more like conditioning information or top left and top right or like what objects to pick up um, and to put it where. Yeah, this was trained on all sorts of only I guess for the the, the simulator part the most relevant one is the video prediction. Um, where they, it was next token, token prediction on like a bunch of different modalities of like language, images, um, different kinds of robot data, stuff like that. Um, one other example of how the plan is actually explicitly used for, for visual planning, which I think I mentioned, I kind of briefly talked about before, where I, you should go do like something like, like visual MPC, where you have, you can kind of like simulate rollouts and simulate different actions. So these are like action conditions. So you condition on robot action to generate the prediction for its frames. And then it basically does like kind of like a, a search, I guess, um, to find the action trajectory that, that moves it most towards like the goal. And th in this case, the left frame is the initial frame. The middle one is like the, the goal, I believe. And then the last one, or that's like the final trajectory of like the actual real robot running it. And then below here is different like simulations of, of what it think uh, it, like what it thinks it might be doing, or the actual interactions. Um, this was the one I mentioned with the inverse dynamics model. So you generate the plan of a task being completed, and then you apply inverse dynamics to every neighboring frame, 
to, to output robot actions per time step, and then you can uh, and then you can execute them on the actual robot to hopefully have it perform that task. Um, the last one is some work we also did in our, our lab. Um, you, you can use the video generate base, as long as you have a likelihood based video model, you can use it as a reward essentially, just by using the likelihood. So you can have it mimic uh, certain, so like if, if, your, if your video model was trained on like certain tasks as well, of like, of, of picking up like the saucepan, of the lid of the saucepan, um, then high likelihood areas or high likelihood transitions would be transitions that um, make it like imitate the same activity. Um, so you can use it as a reward for, for downstream reinforcement learning. Um, and it, it works decently well. Okay. Um, and the last one is, or the last section I'll be talking about is just on video editing. So that's the other main application that I think people are interested in. Um, which probably started off mostly with images. So a lot of these works will be, a lot, a lot of the works in video editing will be like, oh, uh, we were able to do this we were able to use like a diffusion model, like an image diffusion model to do image editing, and the extension to doing something similar to video for videos is like kind of straightforward, depending on like the edit that you want to do. Um, some of these are not restricted to diffusion models. Like for control net, it, most of it is diffusion, but the actual downstream generative model doesn't matter. Um, and the way control net works, if you've heard of it, is essentially you're just augmenting a pre-trained generative model or a pre-trained image or video generation model uh, with extra conditioning capability. So let's say I want to generate an image condition on like the, like the cami edge map or something, or on a depth map, or on a like human pose, something like that. And the way this is done is, there's many ways to do it actually, but for control net, the way they do it is they just have like two copies of the model. So on the left, or on the, like the, 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 the rightmost, um, the rightmost figure, the left side is let's say standard stable diffusion. And then the right side is, that's in blue, is like extra parameters, where they basically, um, where there's like extra like trainable parameters that's a copy of the, the same block that's frozen. And then that accepts in the conditioning information. So usually the conditioning information for this case is the same, the same shape as the image. So if it's like an edge map or like a depth map, it's like the same uh, resolution as the original image. And then you can feed it through the network and then condition on those features um, for your, your frozen models. And so the whole thing is trained assuming you have some sort of like pair data. You have like, I mean, some of it's easy. Like if you, if you want to make like, if you want to condition like a grayscale version, you can just convert the color image to grayscale. And that's pretty easy to convert pair data for depth. You can maybe apply a depth estimator. Um, for some of these, you can usually just run a model to, to, to compute that data. And this is kind of what it looks like. So this is for images. So for the, the, the top is, I guess, an example of that conditioning information. So sketches, normal maps, depth maps, canny, different kinds of edge detections. Uh, segmentations, that would just be you, you input as like RGB. Uh, human pose is pretty popular. There's like a lot of things that you make characters want to do different dances or something. Um, and yeah, so the generation basically, it just takes into account all of the conditioning information and it aligns with that. Um, but everything else, usually just like the color or something is like randomized or like the texture is like randomized and you'll see things that are different. And you can do the exact same thing for video. There's like no reason you can't. You just take the 3D unit and you add conditioning the same way. Um, but just in this case, your conditioning information is, is like a video, it's, it's like a pose video of people dancing. So, I, so the left is the, uh, I think what the pose was computed from, and then the right is you can condition on the, or the, the most right, you can condition on the human pose in the middle, and then like a text prompt. So the text prompt is like some, I forgot, it's like some business person in a suit in like 1800s London or something. Uh, and then you can do depth as well there. That was, I think, the text prompt was like the style. So like some sort of animation style or something. So this is fundamentally just like, you can you can choose a condition on every, anything as long as you have the data or you have the pair of data to, 
to turn it on. So this is more for, this is I think changing the hair color and then from daytime to nighttime. Some things are not preserved that you, like for example, the, the, top, the, the top row, the prompt was just mainly to change the hair color to red, but you can also see it change like the, uh, you can see a leak out. There's like the, the walls that are connected to the window are a different color. One is like more brownish on the, the original is more brownish and then the other one is like more reddish. Another way is um, called SD edit. It's pretty simple. This is like more specific to diffusion models. Um, but the way this is done is that you intuitively is as you apply the diffusion forward process, you noise and noise and noise your image more. Um, and then uh, and then you can reverse it with like with a new text prompt that you, you edit. So the, the way it kind of works here is like is like you, you have like so in this case you have like your, your, your like your your stroke image, which is that input. And then as you noise and noise and noise, the the, the, the distribution of that image gets gets larger and larger because you're adding more and more Gaussian noise. Um, and then the same thing, if you also noise, let's say, like a, like a target image, you, you don't exactly know what it is, but if you apply more and more noise, you also see the, the, the distribution expand again. And the intuition here is that as, as these both expand more and more, they will overlap eventually somewhere. And then, so once you've applied enough noise, you can then apply the reverse SD with like a new text prompt. So if you have this as input, and then maybe the, the, new, the new text prompt you have is like a, a realistic image or a high definition image of or something. Um, then it, it will sample, um, it, it will denoise, but now denoise in a different direction towards like your desired target image. So this is the actual process of kind of what I described. So you, you, you have like, so for text conditioning, so you have your uh, your image, and then you have, let's say, an edit caption. So you can apply the forward process to your your image. So you apply like some amount of noise. The the amount of noise you apply is actually is a hyperparameter. Uh, so that's something that you can tune. The more noise you add, the more information from the original image you destroy. Um, and the, the less noise you add, the, the more it retains fidelity. But the less that it can it can like change stuff. Um, and yeah, and then so once you have your noise image, you can then apply the reverse process with a new with a new caption prompt. Um, that I kind of went over already. Um, so this is an example. So you you can, you can imagine for for videos, this is you can just take a, any pre-trained text to video model. Uh, mm -hmm. You you can you can have like this this bear. You can apply noise to it, and then you can sample it back out uh, with a new prompt like a bear dancing made of wooden blocks. And then, so you can see some of the course information is preserved, like the general shape of the bear, um, and also the, the color of the bear. Um, because as you're noising it, you probably haven't noised out all of like the ground color. It's probably still there. Yeah. Um, what does stroke mean? Where did you find that? Uh, oh, that, that was from like way back when like, it's like a sec, it's, it, it's like you, you can imagine like, um, I think they have this capability in some, like maybe Photoshop or something, where you can instead of drawing, instead of an artist drawing the full image, they can just draw like, um, they can just like do like color blobs to represent different things, mm -hmm. and from that to render the the original to render like a more realistic image. Okay, and, and so that's what the authors are supposedly like the novelty when using when they're just using text. Uh, no, the 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 novelty is this is this ed editing process is like. I mean, it's very simple. You just apply noise, and then you sample back out with a, with a new prompt. So the new prompt will usually reflect something different than what was in the original image. Uh, oh, okay, I guess. Okay, so it's added like the difference between the meta and the caption. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And how do they use the text to block it out? Like, do they use like the noise? It's a standard diffusion sampling with like, like CFG or something, with, with like, yeah, just standard guidance.
Um, pixel space. Uh, well, it depends on the model, I guess. So if, if the model is a pixel diffusion model, it'd be in pixel space. If it's a latent diffusion model, it'd be in latent space. So it would work. It's always latent space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so you get yeah, these kinds of ideas. You can make things into Legos. So yeah, so like depending on how much noise you add, you can have the background. Some of the background can be like destroyed. So you'll see some of the background there, like all white now. There's no horizon. The 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 road is kind of gone. I mean, it's just a blob now. Um, so it's like a hyperparameter that you can tune. Yes. It, it, it is the same. Like the intuition is like you're after you've corrupted enough, add enough Gaussian noise, then uh, that 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 noise is now a um, so so now the resulting sample from that noise. If you apply the reverse process back, there's a lot of different images, right? Mm -hmm. There's a huge like it, it's not only your original image that was in, is, that as a possible solution. There's now a bunch of images that are possible solutions. No, no, no. Yeah, the intuition is all the same. Very, like, I'm not sure. Okay, it, it, it works on real videos, though. Okay, I yeah. see. But yeah, this is unclear. Yeah. Um, okay, and the last paper I'll be talking about is Quadremix. Kind of supports more general video editing. Um, so the, the, way, the way this works, I mean, I guess in its simplest terms, is um, you have like a pre trained like, video diffusion, like text for video diffusion model. And then um, you can apply an SDE style, an SDE style thing, but that kind of like limits it towards like general, broader style changes. Um, you're still retaining a lot of the structure of the video. So it's like, what happens if you also want to edit like, the motion of the video? I have a, I have a video of like, shoot, I have an example here. I have like a video of a monkey on in water, and then you want to make it uh, wave its hand, something like that. So, so something like SDE edit wouldn't really work because it preserves all the course motion or course information in the video. Um, so we would need a different approach for this. And the way this works is very similar to if you're familiar with like Dream Booth style things. Essentially, you can fine tune. So you you can essentially fine tune on a single video. So you fine tune this entire like pre-trained text video diffusion model on this one desired video that you want to edit. So kind of expensive because you have to do this fine tuning every time. Um, but you, yeah, you fine tune with the video and then you can have like a rare token, which they also have used in like Dream Dream Boost style called like T star. It, it could be just any, it's just like this rare token is just any token that is not very commonly used in, in like in language. You can just like do like a, a count, you can just go through like a potentially like a bunch of captions or like a large like natural language like corpus and just like count the frequency of each token uh, as it appears in the, in the text, and then take some tokens that are extremely infrequently used. Or sometimes it's like, if you decode them out, they're like just really random things. Um, but you, you, you can just treat this as like a, a, a token that you feed into like your caption. So instead of like, so when you're fine tuning, and it's like uh, a video of a monkey, instead of fine tuning with that caption, you would do like a video, a, a, mon a, a monkey, or a video of like T-star. So that will hopefully capture like, Kind of when it sees that token, it'll know. Oh, we're talking about this specific video or of this specific monkey or, or entity or whatever. And the fine-tuning loss here is just the diffusion loss. So you you just ask it to 
to, but it, Eugene always has like this one single video. So it's like batch size one training for like 50, 100 iterations um, on the single video that you find genius model on. There, there are some other design choices here where they not only did, uh, not only do you fine tune on, on videos, you can also fine tune on individual frames or, or, or like individual images or, or mix, mix of images. Um, in those cases, it's the same, but you can just like fast mask out any temporal operations in, in the network here on the right. Basically like an attention mask or something, which I'll show an example of, of why this, this could be useful for some things they did. Uh, yeah, fine tuning loss. The final fine tuning loss they did was just the video diffusion loss, and then another like video diffusion loss, but with the temporal things masked out, which support like per frame stuff. So some examples of what they did. So left is the input video. I think these are real videos, so these are not generated. Or I mean, these would be pretty good generated videos if they were. Um, the right is the generated video of like slicing the cake. Kind of interesting because it does like. The, kind of the physics do kind of change here. Like slicing the cake is a lot more like resistant potentially, I guess, compared to cutting through a fruit. So the knife kind of slows down there and um, kind of like sticks to the knife. So this is where the image fine tuning loss kind of comes in. They just fine tune. You can just treat as like concatenating like seven images of uh, different viewpoints of the same action figure. And then um, you can prompt it with this edit caption. So in practice, it wouldn't be like a toy fireman. It's probably like a T star where like your unique token is lifting weights. Um, this was pretty neat. You can kind of, yeah, it's, it's a toy fireman lifting weights. So. so this is the monkey one that I showed. Kind of works, but there's some like oversaturation in terms of like the results. Not exactly sure why. Yeah. Um, and then there's also some trade-off between like potentially like how much noise, you, like during sampling, how much noise you add, and like how much you fine-tune. The longer you fine-tune, the more it, it starts fitting to the original video on like, the right column. And then noise is kind of like SD edit noise. So the more noise you add, the more information uh, is corrupted. So it can change the background more. If you add very small amount of noise, and all the fine-grained details are still there. So when it samples. It's still like a grass or in like a river or whatever. Um, but if you add more noise, then some of the core structure is retained, like the position of the monkey, but it's now sitting in a different environment. And if you add too much, it basically just generates a different uh, video. I think the caption here was like an, an orangutan in a bathtub or something. Yes. Uh, that depends on the method whether it would support that. For this one, no, because you have to fine tune. It, it would support max, it would support just like the, the training distribution length. But some sometimes, depending on the method that's developed, it can extend to longer videos. Okay. Uh, the last one that you can do with the fusion models um, is also do video in painting. This is from Lumiere where you can crop out or like mask out certain parts of the model and then prompt it with something different. So you have your original video on the left and then the second one is like wearing a bathrobe or something. You, you have to tune the, ma the, the masking region for each one, depending on what you want to change. But you can insert different objects. It's wearing like a party hat or something or it's like standing on like a wooden stool. Yeah. Cool. Yep, that's pretty much it. Um, 